uh, kind of round us out. We've heard a couple of talk, bunch of talks today about how we're making progress. There's a lot to be excited about, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, you can help. <laughs> So this is the exciting part. Um, one of the ways that we can move things forward um, is through this registry that I'm going to tell you all about. What is a patient registry? Why are people talking about a registry? Why do they exist, right? So fundamentally, the problem is that it's hard to study disease. And the less common the disease it is, the harder it is to study. Um, Rare diseases are defined as diseases that affect um, fewer than 200,000 people in the U.S., which works out to about one um, in 1,600. Um, they're hard to study just because it's hard to get enough people in the same place, unless you're in Atlanta, who have the disease um, for you to be able to study it. Um, nobody in this room probably needs me to tell them this, but it's worth, I think, big picture-wise, remembering that even though rare diseases may be rare, their cumulative burden is huge. So. There's enough rare diseases out there, maybe about 7,000, give or take, that 25 million Americans are affected by a rare disease, um, and one in 17 people will get diagnosed with a rare disease in their lifetime. So um, we got to find better tools to study these diseases that are really impacting people's quality of life. It's a blank slide. So how does a registry work? So a registry is a repository for information about people who have a disease that can be used to study the disease. And there's a couple of ways that information can get into the registry. Um, one, and the way that the foundation registry is going to start out, um, is that patients enter their own information, online, by mail, whatever. Patients put their information in the registry, and then we have this repository of data. Um, a lot of registries that are out there work actually by having healthcare providers also add data about the patients into the registry. That's a nice someday thing to think about for the foundation registry to do. We're not doing that right now. And then the registry is used in a couple of ways. So researchers can go to the registry and using data that's already in there that you all have entered, ask questions about hypersomnia, um, analyze that data, um, and, and see trends in data that way. And then also, if Dr. Ong wants to ask a bunch of people a questionnaire about um, CBTH, he can go to the registry and say, I have this study I want to do. Um, please." put me in contact with people who want to be in research studies because they have this disease. And so it's valuable in both of those ways. So if you don't believe me, um, <laughs> believe David Meeker, the CEO of Genzyme. Um, I think reading PowerPoint slides is evil, but I'm going to do it because I think his words are really powerful. So creating a registry of patients is the single most valuable action that a rare disease community can take. So I'll let that sink in. Um, if we're going to do one thing, this is the thing that we should do. This is how powerful registries are. It's the single most important thing you can do. It's critical knowledge that makes the, study, the disease easier to study, that increases the likelihood of finding better treatments um, because the disease is easier to study. All right, you don't have to believe him either. Um, I'm going to show you what some registries have done. Um, so what, what can registries do? How does it really help researchers? Um, so a couple ways, right? Based on the registry information alone, you can learn a lot of stuff. Um, we heard about clinical trials earlier. Clinical trials are the gold standard. They're really helpful. There's a lot that you can't tell in a four-week clinical trial about what happens in the real life to real people with a, you know, suffering with the disease and living with it on a day-to-day -day basis. You can get that kind of real-life information from a registry. You can also see trends um, in, in healthcare and what different centers are doing, how things are changing over time to help improve the quality of care people get face-to-face -face in their doctor's office. Um, and, and then you can really start to understand these things, like how is the disease impacting people's day-to-day -day lives, and, and what are we missing in our treatments in terms of those impacts to, again, develop better treatments. And that's totally separate from the fact that then you also have a registry of people who want to be in other studies. So whenever we do a study and we need volunteers, we have a place to go and say, help us with our study. P.S. Help me with my study. Um, so the other reason that it's nice to have that opt-in is if you do go to the NIH and you say, or any other, any other grant organization and say, 
I want to do a study of patients who have this disease, it's really nice to be able to say, and you know what? I'm going to be able to do it because there's this registry which has 1,000 hypersomnia patients in it who have opted in to be contacted for future studies, rather than saying, well, it's a rare disease, but I think I'll find the patient somewhere. So just having the registry exist helps researchers get money <laughs> to prove, you know, to, to be able to do the kind of research that needs to be done. So it's not just us. Everybody is coming around to the idea that registries are a, a wealth of information. And so I just PubMedded patient registry to see published clinical research studies um, that, that use patient registries. And you can see by years going up, increasingly, um, more and more studies are looking at, are using registries as their, as their source of data. If you just look at all studies that have been done in PubMed, you don't get this shape. You get sort of a, a more linear increase. More and more people are, are relying on registries. So I'm going to talk about two registry success stories because it's all very well and good to say they're helpful. I think it's better to say how they're helpful. Um, and then we'll talk more about how you can get involved in the hypersomnia registry. So the first success story I'm going to talk to you about is um, the, this disease called multiple sclerosis. Um, and one of their registry successes. So multiple sclerosis is a, a bad chronic neurologic disease uh, where people end up with a variety of neurologic symptoms. They can end up weak, they can end up numb, they can lose their vision. Um, unlike an IH, there's multiple FDA approved treatments and so that's great for them. Um, but even though they have multiple FDA approved treatments, there's actually not that many head-to-head -head trials. And you know, people have this disease forever and so it's hard to know sometimes what drug do you do first, what drug do you do second. There's no trials that get at that. Some people do better with one drug than another, and it would be helpful to know who's going to do better with what drug. Um, this is a disease people have for decades, and the clinical trials are like months long. Um, and so there's a real disconnect in the kind of data we get. Um, and then a problem with clinical trials and anything is that you don't see rare side effects um, in clinical trials because they're too small. You see real side effects, rare side effects in, in real use. So the MS world has really come around to this idea that like to deal with real world problems happening in, in human beings existing in, in real life, we need both beautiful, pristine evidence from randomized controlled trials and we need real world evidence studies. They give us different information about the different kinds of um, issues that people have. So randomized controlled trials are very pure. You, you very carefully pick the subjects, you control everything, um, and you can say at the end of the day precisely for this very narrow group of people, this drug does precisely this, right? The real world evidence is more in people who have this disease and maybe have some other diseases, because that's how most human beings are, um, how do the drugs really work? Um, the um, limitation of the real world evidence studies is that, you know, the nice thing about a clinical trial is there's always a placebo or some sort of control arm so you can say, I know precisely where, what this drug is doing. In real world evidence studies, obviously we can't do that. Um, so the idea is not necessarily that one is superseding the other, but that they offer really complementary information. Um, Randomized control trials are wickedly expensive per person. Real world evidence studies are a lot more affordable. Um, and they're a lot more generalizable. They, they apply to more people. Um, so the MS, the MS world has sort of embraced um, patient registries. And I'm just going to show you a couple of things that they found from patient registries. And, and the way they're using patient registries in, in MS with both of these studies um, is one of the main goals of registries, which is as a, as a way to generate a hypothesis, right? So this is never, a registry is never going to be able to definitively answer the question, does modafinil work for idiopathic hypersomnia? Eventually you need a randomized controlled trial, but the registry can help you generate hypotheses about which drugs might be best so that you know which ones to do the expensive test drug study in. So one of the things they, they saw as a signal in the um, MS registry is that, so people are on these drugs for decades, and so it's actually not that uncommon for people to switch from one to the other. A lot of them involve needles, and a lot of them have side effects, and so people sort of get weary of one drug and want to give another drug a try and see if it does better. And they basically just looked in the registry, um, and whether people stayed on the drug that they were on in the blue or changed to another drug, 
from this particular drug, they looked at how many people got worse. <laughs> and actually, it turned out staying on the drug you were on was a lot better than switching around drugs. Now, nobody's going to take this registry study and say this is gospel, but if this is really true, like if somebody confirms this is in a trial, this is really important because this means we should be telling patients, stay with what you're on. The other thing that's been held, there's been a lot of things from MS registries, but the other one that I pulled out is, um, so even though there's lots of randomized controlled trials, there's other symptoms that, you know, not every symptom of a disease gets studied in a randomized controlled trial. And so tremor in particular is common in an MS, but it's not really well studied in the drug trials. And so we have no idea what drug to use, and so people just guess. Um, and so in the registry, they were able to at least look at who'd been put on what and how many people found different drugs beneficial. And so, again, this is not a randomized controlled trial. I can't prove that these drugs are best for tremor, but if I have a patient with MS who comes in with tremor, until we have some better data, I'm going to put them in one of the drugs that has the big line, you know, the high, the high bar with it. It's the best evidence that we have. Without the registry, we wouldn't have any idea what to people, put people on. The other success story I'm going to talk about is um, in a disease called cystic fibrosis. So this is an inherited disease um, that causes a number of problems, but particularly with the lung functioning, um, patients end up having a lot of recurrent uh, lung infections, kids end up hospitalized, mortality with this disease is still terrible. Um, it's a lot less terrible than it, than it used to be. Um, and they've actually had a foundation um, for 50 years. <laughs> the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has been around, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, and so I'm going to talk about like the things your registry can do when you've been around for 50 years. I'm hoping our registry can do some of these things like in a few fewer decades than that. Um, <laughs> but this is like the like this is amazing kind of story. Um, they use the registry for all kinds of things. So they use the registry to. Um, you know, see changes over time, like over decades in CF care and between countries, the clinical care that people are, are receiving, they use it to sort of evaluate new trials so they can decide which ones need to have clinical trials. Um, they can um, evaluate how different healthcare systems are working. They use a registry for all kinds of things. And really, at the end of the day, the take-home message is that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Registry, so this is a patient organization foundation, their registry has just enabled countless studies of CF over the years. So this was a um, evidence-based review of all of the registry-based studies that have been done in cystic fibrosis that were published um, from 2012 through the very beginning of 2015. So in three years, there were actually 41 studies that were registry-based uh, that were done in CF. Some of the registries were doctors putting information about patients. The CF registry is patients putting in their own information and then um, doctors putting in information as well. So it's one of these sort of hybrid registries. Um, but just to give you an idea of what a registry can do, so I just pulled out all the ones that were done by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Registry. Um, of those 41, year, 41 reg, uh, registry studies over three years, and you know they figured out that CF is getting better, treatments are getting better, so lung function is improving in six-year-old kids. Um, it's, um, it, it turns out that if you're a CF um, adult, it's better to transition from your pediatrician to um, a grown-up doctor. Um, they found that out from the registry, um, but wait, there's more. Um, <laughs> They figured out um, how the risk of having a pulmonary infection um, corresponded to the care that you got, what gender played in that, um, how wheezing in early life affects lung function later, what's different from the US to Australia. I could go on and on and on and on and on because there's still more that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Registry made possible, um, looking at which antibiotic is best if you have a respiratory infection, looking at some of the microbiology of the infections, because remember, there's doctor-supplied information as well, um, looking at gender and its effect on survival, um, and so on. Um, and, and the take-home here in yellow, 19 studies, 19 studies in three years. That's really remarkable for a patient foundation registry to, to do. So that's, that's where we want to go. Um, it'd be great if we had 19 studies in IH. 
um, in, in three years. But um, it would be great if the registry could be part of that as well. Um, they have had many, many successes. Um, again, com comparing care across countries, generating hypotheses for future studies that then have been tested in future studies. Um, seeing the trends in improved survival, the, the lungs here um, basically are showing that over 30 years, you basically had a lot of improvement in lung function um, at the different ages because of better care, um, and they were sort of able to capture all that. Okay, but we're not actually here to talk about lung disease, um, unlike maybe some of the rest of the meeting we're at next week. Um, what does this have to do with hypersomnia? Um, what is cords? What does this have to do with you? So CORDS is a registry for rare diseases. <laughs> and so I have to pause um, and just have a slide about, is hypersomnia a rare disease? Um, Dr. Arnold sort of made note of that earlier. Um, the registry, I like to think of the foundation and the registry as being for everyone with hypersomnolence. So we're not gonna get too caught up on, do you have IH, do you have narcolepsy type two, do you maybe have narcolepsy type one? If you have a disorder of hypersomnolence, your information will be useful to the registry. And so don't worry about what your diagnosis is as long as you have a sleepiness diagnosis or you are working towards a sleepiness diagnosis, the registry would be for you. But the way the CORDS registry works is as long as one of the diseases is rare, <laughs> then everybody can play. So Klein-Levin syndrome is rare. Everybody agrees that Klein-Levin syndrome is rare, and so we're good with the registry as far as that goes. Um, narcolepsy is actually considered a rare disease. Narcolepsy type one, narcolepsy with cataplexy is about one in 2,000 people, so that counts. Um, there are people who think idiopathic hypersomnia is rare. Um, we don't have great data to answer that question. But anyway, so don't necessarily take away from this that I'm saying that idiopathic hypersomnia is a rare disease. It might be, but it's gonna be treated like a rare disease for the purpose of research so we can get more people together to get better data, to get better answers to important clinical questions. So CORDS, um, is a patient registry for rare diseases. It stands for Coordination of Rare Diseases at Sanford, um, which is a health system. Um, and basically, they, their whole role in life is to be a patient registry for any rare disease that wants to be a part of it. Um, it's an international registry, although they tend to work in English, and so Mostly English-speaking countries are represented, although they will translate things that they need to be translated. And they really see themselves as not, they see themselves as being where the registry lives, but they don't necessarily run it. They really have to partner with an organization like the Hypersomnia Foundation um, that, that can be the, the patient side of things, the advocacy side of things. Um, this whole registry is not cheap, but amazingly was funded um, by an extraordinarily generous um, philanthropy gift. And so this is, registry is gonna be around for as long as I'm apparently the um, chair of the medical advisory board. Um, <laughs> maybe longer. Um, so you're asking yourselves at home and here in the room, am I eligible to enroll in this registry? So basically what you need to enroll in courts is a rare disease, or a disease of unknown prevalence, like idiopathic hypersomnia, that we tend to think is rare-ish, um, or you don't actually have a diagnosis yet, but the thing that your doctors more or less think you're likely to have is probably going to be rare. So that's the CORDS rule. The take-home point is if you are listening to this or sitting in the room because you have the symptoms and you're not here as a supporter, although thank you supporters for coming, if you have the disease and you're hearing my voice, you should definitely register in the registry. You are definitely eligible. Okay, so how does that work? Um, who has the information? Is it secure? Who gets to know what about you if you register? So somebody has to know who you are. So the CORDS personnel, the, the people who actually work at CORDS, um, will have access to your name, your contact information, your identifiers like date of birth, because somebody has to be able to link everything together at the end of the day. When you register, you can opt into a variety of levels of, of other people being able to access your information. But if I go to the registry and I say, 
I want to know how many people in the registry were diagnosed before the age of seven. I don't know. Um, they won't send me any of your contact information. So researchers that apply to use the information only get information that is totally stripped of anything identifiable. So researchers in wherever who apply to the, to the registry won't know who you are. Um, the Hypersomnia Foundation can use registry information that's, again, been stripped of information about you if they want to know how many people have registered for the, for the registry and so on. You can opt in. If you don't mind the Hypersomnia Foundation having your contact information, you can also opt into that through CORD so then they can see who you are, which certainly makes things like communication easier, but it's optional. Um, and then because CORDS houses a lot of different registries, actually other rare disease organizations can use your information absent any information about you like that's identifiable, um, to sort of look across diseases, right? If a lot of people are dealing with rare diseases, sometimes it can be helpful to, to compare to or, or more. Everything stored in electronically in a way that's very secure, everything in hard copy is locked in a fireproof cabinet and so on, the standard things that we do to protect research information. So basically the way CORDS is gonna work in a nutshell, um, you'll enter your information online, by snail mail if you prefer. Um, it will go into the CORDS Hypersomnia Registry. The Hypersomnia Foundation can use it for their uses without your information. Researchers can get ethics approval to access your information. They can access your information without anything about you that's identifiable. Researchers can contact CORDS and say, I have this study. Please tell everyone who's interested to contact me. So we have an easier time finding patients to be in our studies. And then other rare diseases can re reflect, request your information. So how big is CORDS? Well, it's relatively new. It started in 2010, not with hypersomnia. Hypersomnia is brand new, but with some of these other rare diseases. Um, and, and you can see their growth in green. Um, they have been steadily growing since they started. Um, in numbers, they have so far across all diagnoses um, 2,381, um, as of very recently when um, Kate modified these slides for me. Um, and um, I gotta tell you, we can make that number like a lot bigger. There's a lot of people who are listening online to this and there's people in this room. Um, we can certainly make that number bigger. The reason there's already diagnoses for sleepiness is we sort of piloted the, um, the registry before opening it broadly to everybody who has a sleepiness disorder. And so there's already a few people who are in the registry. Thank you for already being in the registry, those people who you are. Um, this really doesn't project very well. It's a breakdown by gender. Blue is men and, and green is women um, for what that's worth. Um, this is a breakdown by country, um, mostly English speaking, but not only. Okay, now the big sell. What can you do to help? You can join the registry. <laughs> That's a shocking conclusion for my talk. So you um, go to the CORDS website, and um, I'm hoping that's on a future slide, um, and you fill out their screening form. So they have a screening form um, that's very, very basic information. Um, and then you send that in, and then they review it, and then they reach out to you um, to complete further information. And they have a, a more detailed questionnaire that they give to everybody across all of their registries um, to sort of get information. And if you don't respond to them, that's what all those other boxes are. That's them calling you again, emailing you again to say, no, no, really, please fill out your surveys. So you fill out the cord stuff, but not just the cord stuff. Part of, <laughs> thank you. Part of uh, what makes the registry useful is that it's not just generic information. There's a lot of detailed questions that the foundation has put together about your journey to a hypersomnia diagnosis, about what medications you've used, and so on. That's going to be the core data that's mineable from the registry at this point in time. So definitely don't just fill out the CORDS questionnaire. Fill out the hypersomnia-specific questionnaire as well. And then you'll mostly be done for the time being until they contact you about once a year to potentially have you do more surveys or just update your information. But you can also wait for the phone. It won't be the phone, it'll be the internet, but wait for the you know, electronic communication to ring um, when people want you to be um, in further studies. But even if you never get contacted to be in a further study, sit tight in the knowledge that the information you've provided to the registry has been valuable in and of itself. 
Can I enroll today? Yes, you can enroll today. Yay! Behind the scenes, there was some question about whether or not you'd be able to enroll today. So yes, you can enroll today. Please enroll today. Go to www.sanfordresearch.org slash cords. Um, if you Google cords registry, you'll also find it. Um, this will also be in the Somnus News. So if you don't want to write this link down on Tuesday, I believe, you'll be getting a Somnus News that has this link in it. Um, but don't wait. Go enroll in the registry and help us work on hypersomnia. Thank you all so much. <laughs>